Anyway, welcome to In Spirit, and uh, welcome to week number what, 13 of our 32-week series of messages. We're looking at the Bible in chronological order, um, beginning to end Genesis through Revelation. We're doing 20 weeks of Old Testament. We'll end that on Memorial Day weekend. Then we'll be doing some other things over the course of the summer. Um, some of you said, what are we doing this summer anyway? I've had that question a couple times this uh, past couple weeks. I'm looking at doing a family series, maybe something on uh, marriage, something on relationships, something on kids, and then I'm also looking at uh, a couple of Paul's letters, maybe looking at Thessalonians for this summer. But then in fall, we'll pick up on the remaining 12 weeks, and uh, we'll do the New Testament, continuing through the story, but we'll take that break for the summer months and do some other things. Last week, we left off uh, looking at King David. And David was known as Israel's greatest king ever. Um, One of the things that I pointed out about David was not only only was David listed in Hebrews chapter 11, in that chapter that talks about all the heroes of the faith, David's listed in there as a hero of the faith. But if you look at Matthew chapter 1, David is also listed in the lineage or line of Christ. Now, that's pretty significant. If you look at the birth of Christ, and you look at the account, it says, For unto us a child is born, and he is born in the city of David. The Old Testament David is a clear picture of what is to come through Jesus Christ. And obviously Jerusalem being that city of David. David restored faith back to Jerusalem. He brought faith and integrity back to a community that had walked away from their faith. Now, I want to go back to David a little bit this morning for fear that maybe I wasn't clear enough last week, and also because a few of you had commented on some things that I think are really important that I go back, because I don't want you to leave last week with the wrong message. Last week, one of the things I said was that I believe that one of David's greatest battles wasn't fought on the battlefield. I said one of David's greatest battle was a battle he fought in the brain. David battled with his human flesh and desires, didn't he? David and Bathsheba. I shared last week how David had let his thoughts turn into actions. I shared how David let his brain take over, if you will. He had thoughts. He called for Bathsheba. He slept with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba became pregnant. And David tried to cover it up, didn't he? He tried to cover it up by having Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. Well, he tried to have himself killed, but any of it ended up David had him killed on the front lines. Now, there's a lot more to that story, and I'm not going to go all back into it, but one of the things I had shared was that David's family paid a price. It was very clear that the family paid a price for that. And there was a mess. There was a mess. My fear is from last week that some people walked away thinking, really dwelling on the sins of our past and the implications on the family or on their families. That's part of it, but there's much more to that story than that. I would hope that that's not what you took away from the story. What I want you to walk away from from that story is that even though there were some horrible mistakes that David made, David was undoubtedly a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says, doesn't it? David made mistakes just like us. And God continued to love David. And not only did he love him, but when David confessed, when he admitted, when he owned his sin and confessed it, God restored him. That's what I want you to remember, that no matter how bad we mess up, when we own it, admit it, and confess it, God is right there to restore us. I think sometimes we look back and we carry the guilt and we look at the past 
And one of the phrases that I often use is that the windshield is so much bigger than the rearview mirror. We let the rearview mirror determine who we are when it's the life that's in front of us that we need to be focused on. God restored David's relationship, and God blessed him again, didn't he? We talked about that with winning more battles, and they had more children. If you look at the cross, that's how much God loves you. That's how much Jesus loved you, that he was willing. This is how much he says, I love you. The cross. And when you look at the cross, when you look at the words of David, even after the things he had done, Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. I said I wanted to say something about Thursday night, Monday, Thursday. As Christians, we know that if we admit and confess our sins and take them to God, he will forgive us, right? Right? But you know what the problem is? We go back and pick those things right back up. The guilt, the shame, the regret. You know who doesn't forgive us? Ourselves. Am I right? We really have a tough time forgiving ourselves sometimes for some of the stuff we've done. And Jesus says, this is how much I love you. He says, I'll bury your sins in the bottom of the ocean. But the truth is, we sometimes in our human, just our, the way we're created, we go back and we dig that stuff up and where am I going with this? Thursday night, I want us to come and look at the cross on Monday, Thursday. And at the end of the service, there's going to be a little sheet of paper right next to you on your seat somewhere or whatever. And I want us to write down on that sheet of paper what it is that you just can't let go of. Or maybe it's something that you're dealing with now that you need to give up. And I want us to write that down. And then it's probably going to be a little noisy in here, but we're going to have a shredder. And we're going to put a shredder at the foot of the cross. And I want you to write those things on that sheet of paper. You're going to come up to the cross near the end of the service and get rid of it. Get rid of it, give it to Jesus, and leave it there, and then take communion and claim his promises. Does that sound like a good thing to do before Easter? He says, I'll forgive your sins. We need to take them up on that. Take them up on it and get rid of some of that stuff. And we're going to do that Thursday night. We're going to celebrate that. So I hope you'll come back. Thursday night. I, I promise you uh, it'll be a service that touches your heart. You and I are not defined by our past. We're defined by the future we have. We're a new creation in Christ, right? We talked about that last week. I used the Greek word morphos or metamorphosis. We turn into something new. We have a living hope, Paul says. I said it in my prayer, a, a hope that'll never perish, spoil, or fade. Easter is freedom from all of that stuff, isn't it? When you go back and you look at the life of David, something as simple as a stone in the Bible indicated freedom. When David took a stone, remember I said last week, who of you would take a stone and shoot that stone at the giant? A couple of you said, I would do that. Something as simple as a stone meant freedom because you know what? When David had the guts to take the stone in a sling and drop the giant, when the giant was dead, the stone is what gave them the freedom. Now you wonder, how does that tie into the cross of Jesus Christ? When I look at this cross, and you go three days later, and you look at the tomb, what was in front of the tomb? A stone. What happened on Sunday morning with the stone? It was rolled away. Freedom from death. Do you see how the old points to the new in something as simple as David and a stone and a stone in front of the tomb? The freedom we have in Christ. That's part of what we celebrate at Easter. This morning, we're going to come to the end of the life of David, and we're going to look at Solomon. And I want you to look at Solomon himself, his commitments, and what happened in the life of Solomon. Now, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 2, Verses 2 through 4, 
And actually, let me just pray before we read that, okay? Father God, we just come to you again this morning, and as we look at your words, I pray that you would lift them off the wall behind me and plant them in our hearts. Lord, just speak to us again, Lord, and teach us what it means to live for you. I just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. It says, I am about to go the way of the earth, he said. It's David. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Haven't we heard this a few times in the last few weeks? This is what I love about looking at it chronologically. We hear this almost every week as we're looking at these Old Testament heroes. They get the same command, right? Then look at this next line and underline it if you're using your tablet or phone or Bible. It says, do this so that you may prosper in all you do. Why are we to obey? So that we prosper in all we do. Or wherever you go. And the Lord may keep his promise to me. And then this next line is really what I'm looking at this morning. It says, if your descendants watch how they live. That's an important line. Watching how you live. And if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. One of the questions I have this morning is, do you think after 13 weeks into this that God is serious about our obedience and how we live? I just, almost every week it comes clear, it's so clear, clearly through the Old Testament every week. God is serious about us obeying him and how he blesses us for doing so. So this morning, end of David, David dies, Solomon's on the throne, his rule is firmly established. The first thing Solomon does is he makes a pact with Pharaoh and he marries one of Pharaoh's daughters. What's up with that? Well, if you look at it economically, it's awesome. Because now he's got this pact with the neighboring nations who have might and power and influence. They have ports, they have commerce, they have goods. They're at peace with each other. Politically, it's a great thing. But making a pact like that and marrying one of Pharaoh's daughters is one of Solomon's first big mistakes. Well, Solomon probably knows that, but he tries to cover it up somewhat. He shows his love for God and his father David by walking according to the instructions he had just been given, except that when it comes to his worship, he offers sacrifices and burned incense in the high places. Solomon sort of bends the rules, if you will. You ever know anybody that kind of bends the rules? Makes it work for their good? That was another one of Solomon's major faults because the high places weren't where he was supposed to worship. It wasn't a legitimate place of worship. Now, listen to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4. It says, The most important of the places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings. Realized he made a mistake, so he goes where he should go. Why Gibeon? Because the tabernacle and bronze altar were there. They were carried off. That's where they were after a war. I think this is important. One night while Solomon is there in Gibeon offering his sacrifices, the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream. Something to think about. Where does the Lord appear to Solomon? When he's in the place where God's presence was. God didn't appear to Solomon in the places where Solomon shouldn't be. God appeared to Solomon when Solomon was where he was supposed to be at. Are you with me in that? If we want God to show up, we need to be in the places God wants us to be. God didn't show up in the places that were detestable to him. So one night, Solomon's in Gibeon. Look at the story. 1 Kings 3, verse 5. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. I didn't think about this till right now, but I wonder what would happen if God showed up in a dream to any one of us in the middle of the night and said, what do you want? What would you say? 
What would you want? I know what I really want. Pole barn. But I'm not sure God would be honored by my wanting a pole barn. Huh? But the guys are going, yeah. But what would you want? What would you ask for? If God showed up and said, what do you want? Solomon replied, you showed faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued your faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made me king of Israel, or king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. That's huge. I'm like a kid who doesn't know what I'm doing. You made me king, but I don't know what I'm doing. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they can't be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom, so God replied, Because you've asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Now, we could spend an hour on that, but I want to fast forward. People came from all over the world to see Solomon, the wisest person ever. Take, a, take some time, maybe this week or in your devotions over the next month. Read Proverbs. Just read through the book of Proverbs and look at the wisdom of Solomon. Well, why did he have wisdom? Because he asked for wisdom. If you go to James in, in, in the New Testament, it says any of you, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask for it. Well, one of the challenges I'm going to give you at the end of the service is ask for wisdom. <laughs> ask for wisdom that we might be found wise. There's three kinds of people in the world. This is from Andy Stanley's book, Ask It. It's a book about wisdom. He says there's the simple person... Now, don't misunderstand me here. But the simple just doesn't know about things and doesn't ask. They just kind of plot on. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, who cares? Kind of simple-minded. And then he says there's the, um, there's the uh, kind of the, they, I forget what he calls it, but they're kind of, they, they know better, but they, but they, oh, he calls them the fool. <laughs> they know better, but they still do what they want anyway. They know what's right or wrong. They know what's wise, but they still do their own thing. And he says they're fools. And if you look at Solomon, Solomon talks about fools. And then the third one is the person who knows what to do or knows where to go and get the right answers. Those are the wise people in the world. And the Bible calls us to be wise. Solomon says to be wise. So you fast forward, Solomon, he's wise. People from all over the world are coming to Solomon. He's got this network with Pharaoh, and he's got... People coming from all over the world bringing him stuff. So now he's got fame and he's got fortune. He's got all kinds of goods. Well, one of the reasons he's given all of that is because Solomon is going to build the temple, isn't he? The temple to be built like no other monument to God ever. Gold and bronze and the most precious of woods. Solomon is going to be charged with building the temple. Well, why did Solomon build it and not David? That was in last week. I didn't cover it, but God said David had too much bloodshed to build the temple. But his son, the line, passed on. Even though there were mistakes, the son would build the temple. So Solomon builds the temple. He takes the precious things from his father, and he puts them in the treasury. Now, I put a picture of a treasury up there. I don't know if you, when you think about these treasuries, you know, you talk about the kings have their treasuries. I don't know if you've ever seen what a treasury looks like, but that's what a treasury looks like. I saw that one in Ephesus a couple years ago, and it's in a big, huge temple courtyard. The only thing that remained in that courtyard is the treasury. It looks like an old bank building or a government building. But they were like little fortresses. And you can go all over Europe to the holy towns, if you will, and you'll find these treasury buildings. That's where they stored up the goods. That's where they stored up the plunder. 
and those buildings still remain. So he's wealthy, and he's got all this stuff going for him. So he builds the temple. They have the treasury. And then there's a sacrifice that says, And Solomon, there were so many sheep and so many cattle, they couldn't even count them. There were thousands. What I want you to get a picture of is just how Solomon just accumulated stuff beyond what you can imagine. And then Solomon prays, and fire comes down after building the temple, and it consumes the sacrifices. And it says, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to build a sacrifice, and first of all, I can't have fires in the building. If I, there were a sacrifice, if I were the priest, or if I were Solomon, and I had a sacrifice, a thousand head of cattle, and put them on an altar and prayed for God's consuming fire to come down and consume them, and it did, put yourself in, wouldn't you think, wow? You would undoubtedly see and feel and know the presence of an almighty God. Sometimes I wish we could have a revival like that in this country where we could just undoubtedly say, wow, just consume us. And I would think if you had an encounter like that, it would be a life-changing experience that would put the fear of God in you. That you would never want to think about doing anything against God, wouldn't it? Huh? It would me. Because sometimes I think God is so distant. But if you saw something like that, it would change us forever. That was Solomon's experience. Listen to his response. 1 Kings chapter 8, 56. It says, Praise be to the God who has given rest to his people, Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us or forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him, walk in obedience to him, and keep his commands, his decrees, and his laws he gave to his ancestors, to our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need. Why? Why? so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is good and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to God to live by his decrees. Do you get the picture that Solomon was so persistent in pursuing God's will? That he really wanted to do God's will. And do you get the picture that Solomon had all this incredible wealth, an alliance and allegiance with the neighbors, uh, um, everything he could possibly want. I mean, he's, he's the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffetts and everybody all combined. The man who absolutely had it all. To put it really simply, he had all the hotels and motels and property on Monopoly. He had it all. I like what John Ortberg says about playing board games. It's like life. When it's done, it all goes back in the box. But he had it all. Listen to what happened when he had it all. Chapter 10, starting in 23. It says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver, gold, robes, weapons, spices, horses, mules. Solomon accumulated chariots, horses. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar, as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Kew. The royal merchants purchased them from Q at the current price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. They also exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and of the Arameans. He had it all. 
But watch this. Chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. He had it all and lost it. Solomon was the king of slow cooking. That's the title I put on there. Do you know how to cook a frog? I'll tell you. you go home and make one for lunch if you can find one. If you have a frog in a pond, frogs like to do their things as they do in frog ponds, sit and croak and be little bully frogs and be happy and jump from here to there. But when things start to warm up for a frog, they stop croaking and they start kicking back and taking it easy. If you want to cook a frog, you don't stick a frog in a pot of cold water. You put a frog in a pot of lukewarm water. And then you turn the burner on. Now, I don't want the animal people, okay, calling me or turning me in or anything like that. But if you just slowly turn up the heat on a frog, the frog just sits back and says, I kind of like this feeling. It's a good, warm feeling. And just kind of liking it all the more. And pretty soon the frog just starts falling asleep. And it keeps getting hotter and hotter. And you know what? The frog doesn't wake up. The frog gets cooked in the pot. I think that there's a danger for us, and there's a lesson in the story, that sometimes we can kind of be like Solomon. We can kind of be like the frog. We can tend to compromise, make things work for our own good, make decisions that aren't necessarily in accordance to God's will. God's very specific on what he allows and doesn't allow. But we'll try to justify it or make it work because the world says... Solomon in his day, polygamy was very common. It was a very common practice by the people, but it certainly wasn't ordained by God. It wasn't sanctioned by God. That's very clear. He knew what was right, but he wanted to partake of the world. And as he added wives, he got cooked in the pot, if you will. Solomon slowly faded away from God. I think there's a lot of things in our life, there's a lot of decisions we make that we know just aren't right. I was, I was reading Daniel this morning. Uh, maybe we need to do a series on Daniel. But you know, Daniel could have had the world. He ended up did having the world in many ways, but Daniel was told he could have everything and be part of the king's court if he just ate the food and drank the expensive wine. And Daniel said no. Daniel said no, I don't want any part of it because it was, it was um, prepared wrong, and there were pagan gods and stuff involved. And Daniel said, I can't partake of that. Daniel stood firm and said, no, I'm not going to participate in the ways of the world. Solomon could have said, no, this is what God wants, but he didn't. When Jesus went to the cross, Jesus could have said, all right, you guys, I give in. I'll quit my preaching. I'll quit my teaching. I'll quit creating all of these problems. I'm just going to slow down and settle down, and I'm just going to blend in with the rest of the world and keep everybody happy. But he didn't do that, did he? He did not do that. He was resolute. He knew what his father wanted, and he did it, even at a huge cost, the cost of death. Solomon let his life be influenced by the world and let it go down a slippery slope called a slow fade. What I really want you to take away this morning, you connect all the dots, I've given you a lot of stuff, 
But what I really want you to take from this morning, you can write this down, is that every decision you make matters. Every decision you and I make matters. It matters to us. It matters to our families. It matters to our co-workers. It matters to the church. It matters to God. I talk to the kids about making plans. You and I make plans every day that we don't even think about. Decisions that we don't even think about. But every single decision we make matters. Sometimes we don't realize how it matters until we get somewhere where we don't want to be and we think, oh, if I would have only done it different when I was back here. Huh? Every single decision we make matters. There's often times we make choices that get us to compromise and we get into commitments that lead to a slow fade. I want you to watch a video this morning, which is a modern day parable, if you will, a story of a person who made some bad choices. And when I say it doesn't just matter to him, but it mattered to his family, to his kids, his co-workers, and everybody. Pay attention to the video, because the video, the video starts at the end. The video starts with the results and it backs up to when the decision was made. And it clearly points out what I'm trying to share with you this morning, that every single decision we make matters. Watch the video. Every decision you and I make matters. It matters to ourselves, to those around us, and to God. God who would send his son so that we would have life. And you and I seek wisdom to make the right decisions. To not give in to the pressures of the world, but to stay strong and finish strong. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this reminder this morning from Solomon, Lord, that uh, it's so easy to slip into ways that are against you and to try and justify for our own pleasure and for our own wills. But Lord, we know that anything that you don't want is not something you would want for us. Lord, help us to never go against you and experience that life that Jesus came to die for. This morning we remember... Jesus, who went to the cross so that we might have life, to have it more abundantly. Lord, I pray that in this week we may look at ourselves in the mirror and look at our walk and keep our eyes on the cross. Where we have wandered or wavered, call us back. Where we need to make new commitments, help us to recommit. Lord, may we not only be strong, but stay strong and finish strong. Lord, we just ask all of these things and ask for your power to do these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for a parting blessing. And just a reminder, the votes for the proposal and then Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I hope that you will come back and join us. If you will be away for Easter Sunday, I pray that you will have a blessed Easter with family and friends or vacationing wherever you're at. But keep your eyes on the cross. This is Sunday. Have a week ahead. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. But Sunday, the Sunday, is coming. Go with the love of God the Father, the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Together we said, amen.